you know, start working on your assignment. So by the week 13th, you're already ready because you also have to do some kind of a presentation uh, defending your, your business, your, your, your assignment, explaining that to me. And uh, so by week 13, I will make this announcement on the email uh, to all of you, uh, uh, maybe today or tomorrow, uh, the, the process, uh, that's what I'm expecting for the next few weeks because we don't have that many. Maybe we have only three weeks remaining. So this is probably, uh, we'll make some announcement that how it kind of, is things kind of work out. Um, so you need to manage your time, be a little bit more effective, start working on an assignment, a group assignment, start getting ready for this test two because all we have is a test two remaining. I hope by today I'll get all the assignments uh, from you guys for Jabalali. You want to make sure that your, your full name, your right name, and your ID on it. And I had some issues with some people writing their abbreviation name or a nickname or, and they don't put their ID. So they, they, they didn't get, I didn't, uh, you know, put their marks, some of them. So um, make sure that you, you, you have your full name and you have your ID written on your assignment or your email so I can track it down uh, easily when I submitting the marks. Um, now, um, well, hopefully today we can finish the chapter eight and nine, uh, and uh, we will, it, it is going to be a very busy day today. Um, we need to look at a few videos also. We we'll want to make sure that everything is going fine. Now, I, I would like you to keep, uh, if you have any question, you can write down so I will answer it. That's not an issue for me. That would be nice sort of if you can do that. Um, now, um, in this week, uh, probably we will need to talk about um, sales and operation planning. Now we moved from supply chains and mostly it's gonna be, we'll be talking about operation side of uh, supply chain management and how we can do, um, amalgamate all these activities together in one you know synchronized way uh, plus do the right calculation for for all these uh, you know uh, issues um, now um, keep in mind test would not be just one more announcement test would not be from the early chapter from chapter one to the end no it's going to be from um, you know um, whatever the last time we wrote the test i think up to chapter five and then from chapter six up to, you know, whatever we're gonna finish in this few weeks. So I'll be making also in that announcement also. So the sales and operation planning, in this, what we're gonna learn, we're gonna understand what sales and operation planning is and how it co coordinates uh, manufacturing, logistics, services, and marketing uh, plans. So how they are all gonna to work together, uh, construct the uh, uh, aggregate plans that employ different strategies for meeting demand. So um, how are we gonna to plan to uh, build our production side and our employees side to meet the demand and uh, explain the yield management and why, um, and, and why, uh, it is an important strategy that we need to look at it. So these are the things that we're gonna speak about it uh, in this class. Now, um, the issues here comes in, what is a, a sales and operation planning? Because what we are looking for, we're looking at something that's supposed to be uh, all working together. We're not looking the sales on one side and operation in one side. And they have to be synchronized uh, very well. Um, so sales and operation planning is a process that helps firm provide a better customer service, lower the inventory, and shorten the customer lead time. It's also stabilize the production rate and give the top management a handle on the business. So the sales and operation planning 
is probably would say it's running the whole business at the very effective uh, way, lowering efficient, lower cost, and maximize the profit. In, 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 in this all is the whole, uh, the game of opening a business. The process consists of a series of meetings, uh, finishing with a high level meeting with a key intermediate uh, decision. Now, there is uh, used to be, you know, two type of, uh, and this is applicable also here, two type of uh, project planning. One is, it's a, you know, it's a waterfall and you plan from the early and, uh, you know, and you set up a very strict way of doing it. And then you have uh, agility way, which is weekly meeting and or monthly meeting, and it's weekly meeting mostly, and you plan it by weekly as it go on. So um, the whole process of it, it's, it's a serious meeting, finishing with a high level meeting where the key intermediate decision are made, not the, the top decision, the intermediate decision where the daily operation and daily sales and all these things or weekly or monthly. This month's, um, you know, occur on an aggregate level. So it, it just pile it up uh, and also uh, has a detailed individual uh, product. So we will talk about how these things is like, a, um, how we gen generate demand from the demand that we have, uh, how we gonna build our production and find out what kind of things uh, we, can, we have to do in order to deliver this demand. And, and, and so if you look at this uh, chart, it's, um, it works like this. It's the, the fact that there is what you call a process planning. And in the process planning, the, you're gonna end up with a, you know, there is a long, long range or long term, there is a mid, mid range, and there is what you call a short term. In the long range, basically, uh, um, uh, just give me a second. Let me see if there is any question. Uh, we'll be in the same day. Um, yes, the, the presentation, no. The presentation, uh, the question is, is the test and the presentation will be the same day? No. The submission of your assignment and the test, the due date of submission of your assignment and the test, it will be the same thing. But then you need to book a time with me at your best timing, if you feel you know, flexible because you are a group. So uh, uh, what I'm expecting from you, you as a group agree with each other on which day you need to uh, 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 present for me. So uh, on the week 13, after the submission of your assignment, I will set up a few days and accordingly you come and book your day, which day is most fit for you. So, and, and there where you, and instead of me sending you um, an invitation on a Zoom, you will be sending me the invitation. So I will be joining your team uh, to, discuss this matter for me. So I will give you some uh, my emails and you have my emails, probably my contact, just to let me know, you know, what's the best time for you to do the presentation. It could be any time, nighttime, morning, I'm open for your suggestion on during the week, uh, after week 13, to up to 14. Um, so don't worry about that. Uh, it's a very flexible. Back to this uh, thing. Um, so uh, the uh, process planning is a long-term uh, strategy or activities. So then you go strategic planning and capacity, strategic capacity, what is it, you know, a capable of this manufacturing or a hotel or a restaurant are able to provide it as a service. And then it's driven from the strategic planning of UC and from supply network, whether planning, if you don't have enough supply, if you don't have, you know, companies that can supply you uh, always, then you might have, uh, you know, it will determine the, your strategic capacity planning. And if from their supply network, you also need to forecast 
and, and uh, uh, forecasting and demand management. So here is the issue, the point is here. Once you set up your strategic capacity planning, which is in the long run, then you start working on your uh, sales and, um, uh, and operation uh, in an aggregate way. In a, uh, in a, we will show how it looks, what it means by aggregate way. Now, this, there is two parts of it, is the sales plan, which is uh, how much people will be selling uh, within your company. But when they are selling, there should be somebody is uh, producing these sales, this product to be sold, whether uh, before they're selling it or after they are selling it. It doesn't matter, but somebody has to do this production. And these two plants has to work together. Now, the, the production comes in and follow the sales plan and uh, back and forth. So if there is an over sales, the production will be kind of a, 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 um, a con contribute to the ability or capacity of able to sell how much they can sell, when can they can sell it, because the production is a certain level. And in, in case of they're overselling, then the production needs to find um, and the ways of producing more or controlling the level of sale. So then the production from the, uh, from, driven from the sale plan, they will have a three part that they need to look at it, which is the service, the logistics and manufacturing. And without going on the details, because we will be talking about it in the details, we said that the service is a, it could be a weekly workforce, uh, daily scheduling, who's supposed to come in, how many people are supposed to be at one hour. We spoke about this type of uh, uh, work and how we can control the services, the logistic, the cars, the vehicle, the loading, the uploading, and then you get the manufacturing, which is a part of uh, the master scheduling, we'll be speaking about the master scheduling uh, and material requirement planning or uh, MRP. And then you, from there, from manufacturing, you will be taking the order of the scheduling and uh, you know, uh, back and forth the dispatching and shifting these things to the warehouse. So this is the process overall uh, coordinating between sales and uh, operation. Now, um, very quickly, when we when we talking about uh, uh, probably the sales and operation program activities, the very quickly overview. It's about sales and operation planning uh, is kind of coined company is together set up to do the best uh, way of working. The most, uh, you know, if you go to any operation, any, any company, the, you would see there is some complaint uh, if it's not coherent the work. The, the production side will say, uh, we don't, you know, we, we cannot, they are, the sales are pushing us hard. And then the salespeople will say, oh, the production side is lazy, is not producing up. So, here, what you need to do, you need to kind of uh, integrate these two together, and uh, it's kind of a coined uh, company uh, in to, to, to aggregate planning. Um, so the new terminology means uh, to capture the importance of cross-functional. These two have to work together uh, on, on the same times. And in aggregation, uh, on supply side is done by product uh, families and uh, demand side is done by a group of customers. So the product families, how they think is working together in, in a same products uh, set, you, you, you start categorizing different products and uh, from the production side, from the product needed uh, to produce these things, you put it in one family uh, issue. Okay. Um, now, um, so as we said, there is uh, the uh, three types. There's a long-term planning. So planning focus on horizon, uh, 
greater than one year, usually is more than one year. And then you have, we spoke about it in chapter one and two, uh, the intermediate planning, different type of planning. Um, the planning focus on a, a three months to 18 months uh, and incremental biweekly, monthly. So three months, three months, three months, uh, something like that up to 18 months. And the short term is daily to uh, uh, daily uh, planning. So we have a three type of uh, planning uh, and it goes up to six months planning for it. So we need to have uh, covered the short term, uh, the mid range and the uh, uh, long range. And each one of them has a different plan probably to look after that. Now, um, in aggregate planning, okay, um, just wanted to comment something. You see, um, when you join join the, the the class, automatically the Zoom will book you in. Will show you that you have joined. So you don't need to, you know, announce your name there or your student number. And I can download these things from the Zoom automatically. Uh, that's one side. Okay. So on aggregate operation planning, a specific the optimal combination of you look at three uh, three things. You look at the the, the uh, production rate, which is the unit completed per unit of time, and uh, how many units you can produce at certain time level, uh, workforce level, uh, how many workers you need, and whether you have that inventory or can be supplied on time um, for producing. So these are the three things you, you kind of look at the specific of optimal compilation, how you um, utilize them up to, you don't want to have a worker sitting there and there is no uh, products to be uh, in the inventories, or you, you, you don't want to have a machine that not being uh, you know, monitored by uh, employees, if it just breaks down or so it gives them a feedback. A supply, uh, you know, enough supply. So that's one thing. The second thing is the product group uh, or broad categories. So it's like, a, how much do I have right now in my inventories? How many will be coming? And uh, how many I will be consuming next month, uh, two months? How, so this is the aggregation. And this planning is done on the intermediate level from a three to 18 months you plan for for this part of it. And you do this planning mostly according to level of sales also, okay? Um, a production planning environment, in, in general, the external environment, you cannot control it most of the time, but you, sometimes you have kind of, a, you, you, you can manage the demand by in a short uh, term. Uh, where you can lower the car, uh, the sales price, or you know, um, it's semi-managed on the on the on the on a demand side. Um, Complementary products work for the firm facing the cl uh, clinical uh, cyclical uh, demand fluctuation with uh, service uh, cycle are more often measured in hours than in the uh, months. The whole thing is this talks about um, uh, probably is the production planning environment. They should take into consideration that the fact that is some stuff that is uncontrollable. And we saw on the chapter six, five, how we mitigate some you know, supplies or the logistic part, how we can fix up some issues. Now also the demand also, uh, we, we learned in the marketing, how we can uh, uh, increase the demand or decrease the demand in a certain time. So you, you do this cycle, uh, you know, the production level up and down, it could be um, hourly or weekly, uh, mostly 
is done. So one hour at one hour, this service goes up, especially in the service side, and that hour goes down. So it's, we, we spoke about that when we talked about uh, customer service. <clears throat> so the input of a production um, planning system, we have to see um, what's the external part of it and what's the internal part of it. And accordingly, we can uh, start planning for production. So we need um, to look at the competitors' behaviors. How do they, you know, when they increase their products, when they reduce their product, how they get it, uh, the cost, lower the cost of producing. We also need to look at the raw material, whether it's available. We look at the market demand. Um, we also need to look at the the, the, the external capacity, such as uh, other factories, if we are, uh, we cannot meet the demand, or can we uh, outsource the service, this product um, producing for other companies, um, the economic condition, and these are all external service. The internal part, um, we look at the current physical capacity and that's what is controlling the sales level, probably. The current workforce that we have, are we keeping in how much it's gonna, you know, to, to bring up numbers of employees how, and train them how much it costs. Sometimes the factory will look at it and say, well, it's gonna cost me $10,000 to, to train somebody on that level. So I'm just gonna give increase uh, give more hours to current employees is safer and better for me uh, and, and cheaper. And th so we, we also look at the, uh, the inventory levels and the activities required for a production. And uh, in general, uh, production planning uh, strategies, which is all, it's according to input of all these issues, uh, around the production planning, then we start looking at uh, production planning strategies that, you know, um, for a meeting demand. So we do some trade-offs between <clears throat> more employee you bring in or more hours or, you know, type of inventory, uh, or whether we bring ahead way more inventories or less. This all trade-offs happening uh, to make sure that your production planning, it's, it's built in a way uh, that meet the sales demand or the demand, and in the same time, uh, uh, at the lowest cost or efficient way possible can be done. So these are the strategies that in the production planning uh, it, it should be considered. So, <clears throat> When we are looking at the cost of production planning, we usually look at the basic uh, production cost, how much it costs for producing this product, um, cost associated with the change in the production rate. Uh, so we look at the how much it costs of unit. Uh, there is a variable cost, which is uh, with the product, increase the productions, how much do we need more machines? or uh, there is extra variable cost involved in it. Um, we also look at the holding inventory uh, cost, uh, which is gonna do some, uh, showing you some uh, calculation how to do the uh, inventory cost and how we look at the back order uh, uh, cost also. Whether we, how often do we need to um, make uh, an order for these uh, replenishing of uh, the inventory, how many times we need to make the order because every time you want to make an order for the uh, production uh, uh, simple uh, I mean, uh, product that you put in the final product, uh, it's gonna cost to make that order. And you notice when you do some shopping online, you might buy something worth of $20 and shipping and handling worth of $100. Uh, 
So it uh, becomes a total price of 120, but in the beginning, you don't know that. You just see the price of a, a t-shirt is a $20, where it's in a market is um, $50. And you say, oh, that's $20. Um, and in the market, $50, I'm saving $30. But then when you buy it, you will see um, shipping and handling is $80. So it becomes $120. Uh, so you'd rather to go and buy it from a store sometimes. So these, these are the, you know, um, the, the back order costs every time you, you're making a, uh, you know, uh, a decision on it. Um, there is a different way of aggregate planning and we will talk about it is basically now we're just we're going to say it's a cut and tray approach there is a linear programming which is a mathematical uh, approach to it and then simulation which is can be done through the pc from through programs and we simulate what if analysis what if we buy that many products uh, uh, material products to produce this how much it's going to cost as a variable, as a, you know, inventory, back order, all these things, we need to look at these, and this can be done with an application. Um, but overall, the, uh, uh, to evaluate um, a plan and how we're going to work on a production plan, how we're going to work on a producing uh, thing is the fact that we need to look there is a three four different plants here and uh, produce the exact monthly production so you just uh, same size same productions exactly uh, and that doesn't need to vary uh, uh, varying the workforce size or the number of the machines the second plan is a produce to meet expected average demand. So um, you, you're, you're, you have an average demand monthly, and then you just, uh, you, you have a demand monthly, and you just produce an average. So today, uh, this month, you're producing a um, little bit less units because the demand higher, and then the next month, you're producing uh, more units, and, uh, you know, because you're exceeding the demand and they will be eventually, you know, it's like a, a, a linear and the demand goes up and down, uh, the production, sorry, goes up and down, a little bit dif differentiate from the, the style. So we have one type, it's a producing one line straight amount and we have something that says it goes a little bit up and down, but it eventually will even up in the end of the year, something like your production year. And the third part is to uh, produce, to meet the, the minimum expected demand. Um, and also, uh, and the fourth type is to produce to meet expected demand always. So the demand, if it goes very high, you suddenly have to uh, produce according to that. And this is mostly, we see it in the service industries where we you try to meet the demand as it goes high. It's also in, in other production, certain seasons of the, of the years, you're also looking at that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is something called yield management. Yield management is the process of allocating the right type of capacity to the right type of customer to the right price and and time to maximize the revenue or yield. This is mostly done through the service. So you you, uh, you just try to match your capacity with the number of the customers it's available. So if the customers match the capacity that you're producing, you're trying to do it uh, at the right price uh, and time to maximize the revenue. You notice that when you're trying to reserve a, a, a plane or a trip to somewhere, you will see that certain time of the year, 
the prices or certain time of the days, the price of uh, air ticket is uh, cheaper and uh, or and the, even the hotels maybe could be cheaper. And they trying to match the level of demand. So they trying to find out um, at what time of demand uh, is a high so they can increase the price and what di what type of days or year or month exactly so they can lower the price and have more people uh, buying into that because this is how you do the yield to maximize your revenue the first time was done, uh, it's probably done by American Airlines, which is they created computerized system. And they started, you know, changing the prices of the uh, hot, uh, the tickets. But now it's also applicable in hotels and, and other type of uh, services. So the yield management uh, basically talks about uh, uh success factors of it is the fact that uh demand can be segmented and can be uh, controlled uh, there is a fixed cost high and variable cost is low and usually these are applicable in hotels because the fixed cost of a building uh, you know the furniture is very high and variable costs like changing the towels and all these things is kind of low. But at the same time is this inventory is perishable so they cannot you know, have somebody uh, sitting on the seat of the plane. The, this is perishable, it's gone. Uh, so uh, usually uh, these are the type of the, uh, or nobody reserving that room in the hotel also is perishable. And also, the product can be sold in advance and demand uh, high variable. So when you have these characteristics, you can uh, you know set it up in a way you will be have you can do the yield or maximizing your profit yield management there. So you can segment the customers uh, during the weekdays. You can give it for the hotels for the employees weekend families you, you can you know um, make sure the capacity of the hotel is always overbooked where you can really manage the overbooking something like that um once again we spoke about as example the hotel hotel offers one set of rating during the week and another set of uh, during the weekend. So that's one of the way of doing it. The, the variable costs associated with the room are uh, very low because all you do is, you know, new soap and new shampoos and all these things in comparison to adding more rooms, which is fixed cost. Rooms is more fixed up. Um, and, uh, Available rooms cannot be transferred uh, transferred from a uh, night to night because it's a perishable good. So uh, once it's, it's not occupied, you lose uh, a revenue. And uh, the other option, an example, is that you can sell, as we said, a block of rooms to a company, to a convention, and uh, uh, or you can um, potentially guess may cut, uh, you know, they might not show up or, so you need to overbook sometimes to manage all these things. So these are uh, five different examples that fits this part of uh, yield management. We said this, the demand can be segmented by customers. And we said we can, you know, there is a demand for families, there can be a weekend and weekdays. And we, we spoke about um, fixed costs and uh, our high and variable costs. And we spoke about uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, the variable costs associated with the room is very low, like changing towels and all these things, but building an extra room there is can be very highly. So these are associated an example 
in the hotel industries case. Now, um, also the price structure must appeal in the same time because you wanna generate demand logical to the customer and has to be justified for him. Uh, a hotel should be a handle a variable in arrival and starting time, what time they should become, what time should leave. All these things takes into consideration and a time between you know the customers, how they can switch the room. Uh, these are issues that it's need to be looked at it uh, and and you know are managed while you're operating in a hotel uh, in the hotel, for example. Um, must train the employees in an environment where overbooking and the price changes are standard occurrence that directly impact the customer. And the essence of yield is the ability to manage the demand. So you're in the hotel industries, um, basically you're uh, an airline industry, something you try to manage the flow of demand, the level of demand, uh, that cannot be done uh, as well as in, in the production uh, sectors. So um, with this, what we have spoke about it, I've spoke about it is the fact that um, how these uh, um, process can be done, how to manage the sales and uh, a production uh, in a uh, in a one a whole a major plan. On the next chapter, we'll talk more about the application side, uh, the software side, the process of it, uh, also about it. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, before we take a break, I just want you to. Um, probably look at a very short video, if you don't mind. And uh, then we can take a, uh, a short break after that. Now this video talks about uh, exactly what we uh, spoke about it. And It's what is the sale a field of operation. expertise with you. Something that can align your business plans with operations and add value to your company. Sales. And so we will be talking about MRP in this uh, second session of the class. And uh, basically we will be um, talking about chapter nine. And in chapter nine, uh, we'll talk about the material resources uh, and the material uh, requirement planning for it. So, uh, in the material requirement planning, uh, what we're going to learn is the uh, describe the, the we're going to sp speak about the MRP or material requirement planning. Uh, we try to understand how the MRP system is structured, how it works, and uh, start analyzing the MRP problem and uh, evaluate and compare MRP uh, lot sizing uh, techniques. There is a two, two more. Uh, to famous technique for that, that we need to, to work with it. Now, um, um, the whole organization in general, it's made of two parts uh, as internal. Uh, now we, we have something says an ERP or enterprise resource planning and MRP, which is material requirements. So enterprise resource planning usually is a computerized system and integration of uh, different uh, programs. And that could be in the accounting, sales, manufacturing, um, business intelligence, as, as we spoke about it last class, um, we spoke about uh, CRM also. So these are the ERP parts. 
And the second part, which is mostly works within the, 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 the plant, the manufacturers, is the MRP or the material requirement planning. And they are usually integrated with, it, with each other. And the logic, uh, MRP is the logic for determining the number of parts, um, <clears throat> components, material needed to produce a product. It, it, is break, it helps you to break down the, what kind of components you need, what kind of parts you need, what material is needed, and how long it takes to produce the final goods uh, for the product. And these two things are kind of integrated with each other. Uh, and we said that, you know, in ERP, you have what do you call uh, the financial, the uh, HR, uh, the sales, the marketing, uh, all these application there, and they are integrated with each other. But in this class, we would be more fo focusing on the material requirement planning or the MRP part of it. <clears throat> so uh, MRP uh, or material requirement planning is uh, the logic that ties production function together from the material uh, and control point of view. So uh, it, it, it connects the, the process of producing uh, um, the stages of productions. They tie them with each other. A, a logical, easily understood, uh, understood approach to the problem of managing a parts component material needed to produce an end item. Imagine that, you know, in the, in the example that we saw in the video, it talks about tent and tent made of three parts. And um, the level of complex, complexity there is a little bit low, but think about if you're talking about um, the, a car manufacturing or even the same tent. If you, if you are already have kind of an, an horizontal, uh, a vertical integration where you produce the plastic and you produce the, the, the irons and all these parts of it. So the horizontal could be more complicated also. Um, so, uh, you know, the production, the final product, what we see is something that we look at it and, but if you ask anybody, in a market who's buying this stuff, how do they produce this stuff? They will say, most of them, they're gonna say, we don't know. We just get these things and uh, we buy these things, but we don't know how to produce it. So it is a big process, a huge process that it takes into consideration, simple stuff. For example, if you're looking at a, a restaurant, which is makes a burger, this is a very complicated operation. If, if all we do is we buy the burger, but you should know that, you know, that the supply of these product, the cooking part of it, the putting things in the right way, um, putting this, uh, you know, uh, the burger, how it's set up properly, um, how it's cooked, level of cooking, um, when you're going to put the lettuce, how you're going to put the tomatoes. We saw these also in the video, how is this process? It's done. It It's part of the MRP also. Um, so uh, it is how much of each part to obtain and when to order to produce it, uh, to, to, to or produce that part of it. So these are the two things that MRP is trying to, you know, um, work with it. And it's, as we said, it's integrated with the ERP, which is, um, it takes us this information probably from the ERP and it's what it makes it is, um, uh, is a demand, depend on demand drive, uh, the uh, drives the MRP. Now, I'm not gonna talk so much about this one, but it is types of that uh, app, uh, MRP application that you can benefit from it. Sometimes you have a you have a manufacturing that assembly to stock like what we saw to uh, in the video. We have a fabricated. We said as an example, what if the this tent is produced 
not only as assembled is plastic or part of it and the iron produced within the same factory. So it's a, a fabricated to stock. You have another type which is assembled to order according to the order. And this is probably made uh, for a truck, generators and motors. The fabricated to stock is like electric uh, switches, uh, pistons. You have the fabricated to order, uh, and it is like a, uh, the bearing, the gears. It, it depends on what you do, whether the M MRP can be very beneficial or a lower beneficial. If you are doing a steel, for example, manufacturing in steel, which is this constant thing going on and producing, in this case, probably MRP benefits is less. But if you take in a product that is a made of multiple small things together, um, like a watch or like a, uh, probably a car, then in this case, MRP can be very beneficial uh, for you. So there is a fabricated to order or could be manufactured to order manufactured to order when it's a fully integrated with the erp or some order comes in and you start as like a a machines a turbine um, a plane these are manufacturing to order and a process uh, so it depends where do you how much you benefit from erp is is determined by the type of products uh, you are producing and how you are producing it. But before you do that, you need to do the master, uh, master uh, probably production scheduling. And in the master production scheduling it deals with the end items is a major input of uh, ERP. The master production scheduling, let's say you have been asked to produce 200 cars, or as we say in the example, 40 tents. That's the master production scheduling. And then when you put this in the MRP, then all the production system um, uh, have, uh, you know, it takes, the MRP takes it into consideration the limited capacity and the limited resources. And we'll show you in a, in, a, in a small trial, MRP, whether this can be the timing to produce and the cost of producing these, uh, you know, trial master through the a trial master of MRP programming. So you can, you know, um, visualize in a way how you can produce these uh, uh, units that's needed, which is got uh, they given us from the uh, the, the master production uh, system, S and it's driven from the demand side of the ERP, which is a sales happening uh, or sales will be happening. So if there is a demand, so it's integrated with the the ERP with the MRP. Now, the master production scheduler, also known as the planner or the MRP controller, because we said that, you know, when you have the master production schedule, will give the MRP, the master, uh, the material resource planner, the Fed, how many units is needed to produce at what time and how long. Uh, so this is why they call it uh, the also MRP controller and ma maintain the, the master schedule. Um, simple example, when uh, a chef, uh, a waitress comes in and writes all these uh, type of foods, uh, 10 burgers, five Cokes, and then he, this piece of paper sticks is he sticks it usually in the front of uh, in the side of the chef so the chef can look at it this is the master production scheduler so the chef will looks at it and start working on the food putting the sandwiches together the way they it's wanted based on the order 
based on the massive production scheduler. And uh, he becomes an, 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 a manual MRP, probably we would say. Um, so it includes uh, the master production scheduler. It also includes the demand from all sources. It keeps the sight of the aggregation, how much is needed and whether it's been increased or, you know, it, it, it also takes into consideration the historical and the futuristic part of it. Participate in the customer ordering promising. So once it takes all the master plan, it will, it gives you a schedule telling you when this things is gonna be produced. So this will be fed up, uh, given to, um, uh, the sales or the, you know, the waiter or the waitress. And, you know, this is when the waiter comes in and says, okay, in 10 minutes, your food will be ready. So this, this is the MRP will give that part saying, that's how long it takes to uh, order that food or producing the 10 cars or making, you know, uh, uh, five jets or something like that. Um, um, and B, it be uh, visible uh, for all lawyer, layers of, of management so everybody can see the process of producing this and where it's located and where it's uh, moving. And we spoke last class in the last class about the, the customer relationship management where you able to <clears throat> tell the customer um, where is the stage of his order is in right now and how long it's gonna take. This is driven from the MRP itself uh, to the business, to CRM or uh, yeah, to the uh, CRM, which is customer. And from there you read it. So this is where it gives you all the uh, uh, layers of management and make it visible when this product is gonna be or at what stage they are. It's objectively managed conflict between manufacturing, marketing, and engineering. So it's basically, as we said, it will tell exactly, then you won't have any complaint from um, whether the manufacturing side or the marketing or the sales side, because MRP will be telling the whole, everybody uh, what's the capacity of producing. So nobody gonna say, for example, the sales side is overselling because uh, you know they can see how much they can deliver. And in the same time, uh, sales side would not say, well, the production side are getting lazy or they're not producing work inefficiently because MRP is a standard of telling the, the everybody is the process of, of that production. Identify and communicate all the problems. So if there is, if there is a problem, it will all cross, everybody will be knowing that. And it's also integrated to the business intelligence and also integrated to the customer relationship management or CRM. So everybody can look at the process and where the process is going on. Now, maybe the simple example, um, what are you gonna say? For, for the, in the aggregate production plan, uh, let's say if there is a mattress that they're looking to produce, and in the first month, they are looking to produce like a 900, second month, 950. Now in, in the first month is made up for four weeks, and it's not talking, uh, the master production schedule for the mattress models, it's giving here. So it's really looking at, saying we need 200 to model uh, 327 We're on the first week. We need uh, uh, 100 of on second week. And it gives you the master of the production, what kind of uh, production it's needed to produce to meet the demand of the customer side. Now, so the, MPS or master production scheduling shows the quantity of each type with the information about the production frame time. And here it's not, it's not showing uh, probably the, the 
aggregate plan where it shows the overall quantity produced without specific typing. So the aggregate plan, it shows that, you know, how many you need to produce, but uh, say like uh, I need to produce within two months, um, 1850 mattress without specific, uh, specifying the type, the type, but in the master uh, production plan, it's, it shows what type is uh, needed. So it's a one level is uh, deeper than the demand generated by uh, salespeople and marketing. Sales and marketing will say, okay, we need 1,850 um, mattresses uh, produced uh, or the management decide that. And then the master production plan will gives the breakdown of what can we need to do. Now, time, usually we said, it has to be in the right timing. So here is where is leeway is kind of a little bit, um, sh shall I say, relax. And sometimes uh, these people um, production can have is sometimes when you're meeting the capacity, then you don't, you cannot, you know, alter the type of that you are producing. But once the the demand is start, you know, the capacity start getting a little bit lower and lower, then you might be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, switch between these uh, types of production that you have. So in the slushy side, where the capacity is lower, you can switch a little bit. And uh, in the liquid liquid time, which is the forecast and availability uh, capacity. So the change to a production plan not allowed when it's the full capacity is working. And then the MRP will be helping you, telling you, okay, in this time you can limit the change of production in the between eight to 15 weeks. And there where you on the end, when you start into this stage where you have the total freedom, any changes the production plan is allowed. So it also control the change level in the production, what type you're producing. Sometimes it gives you full freedom you can change. And sometimes it gives you very strict according to the capacity uh, that you need. So if you're producing, 50 kinds. So an application of this will let you know uh, whether you can switch between these uh, products or not. So it's a very uh, helpful in this case also. Now, um, as we said, it, it, a master schedule items are sold to the customer. So it is it is when you go and you, you start, you wanna sell uh, or your sales happens, there is a promise happens to the customer that you will be delivering or you are delivering or it's been delivered. So it this is, it create a uh, master schedule items are sold to a customer uh, independent demand. And this is how, this is kind of a, uh, the product itself, uh, the final product is looked at it as an independent demand. But to build that product, you need other product to put in the material. And these materials called the dependent demand. According to how many units is created, which is independent, that you need to connect uh, the other materials being connected. So these are uh, who made the final product. They are the ones who is called dependent demand. And the, the final product is called independent demand. So the stock currently hold in the inventory may be assigned to a customer order um, allocated or may be available for a future customer order. <clears throat> so 
you have some certain stocks in the in the market in your warehouse and these are considered to be inventories these are the the breakdown materials that will be producing the independent product and they can be also with the mrp assigned to that unit of the product or, or if there is not available, it's telling you that you have to request this. So these can be allocated for a production or available to be a promise. So when you go to a customer uh, service and you order a mobile, for example, then they look at it, they look at the warehouse and we show that the integration between warehousing and the uh, supply uh, front desk and they could be the products is on the shelf. So it's assigned to the customer or it's being shipped, bunch of them. And one of these units, which is being shipped to the warehouse is be available. And you can promise the customer that can be uh, uh, assigned to him. And also communicate the current available to a promise quantities. So they, it's also, you know, whether you have 10 units and somebody's asking it 12, so you can say, okay, I can supply you this month 10 and two in the next month, or you can, you know, um, break it down in the next three months or four months. So it's, it also does that for you. Now, <clears throat> what do you, uh, uh, the product demand sources, um, it comes driven from the customer's uh, specific order place, either external or internal customers. But it comes to through the aggregate production plans, the firm strategy for meeting the demand in the future. And we spoke about it, and I'll show you how it works in in the, you know later on. Yeah, implement through a master production plan. So there is a demand. And that demand for that unit, uh, which is the independent unit made of few products, and these few products should be integrated, uh, becomes part of the, the demand itself. Uh, very quickly, the MRP system is very important to see this is the overall how it works the aggregated production first it comes from the forecast of uh, demand uh, from customers then there is an aggregated uh, production plan so it consider what they uh, demanded last month what's demanded next month and what's demand this i mean last month and uh, two months ago three months it's aggregated productions and this all comes in will give the feedback to MPS, the master production plan. And also uh, firm order from customers that they are getting. So there is a forecast demand and there is a orders already there. And these are all will be going to the material planning, uh, which is MRP, which is the material planning uh, or resource planning. And um, to produce that, you need to a uh, feedback from the engineers how these things is designed and probably how they're manufacturing and the machine to produce it is set up and they will produce the bill of material bill of material is basically it tells you this product the end product the independent product made up of what dependent product and all will be also the inventory whether we do have enough inventory or during the time we are producing. And these are all considered to be um, the MRP system inputs. And they're accordingly, when the, this input comes in, all is gonna be integrated with each other for into the MRP. And MRP will be, uh, you know, um, calculating uh the product now the output is has two uh, uh reports one is the plant 
order release for the inventory and production. So it takes an action showing that uh, the plan is being, what time is gonna start or have started and what part, part of it and how long it's gonna take all this process. And the second report that generate is the exception report probably um, um, if there is a delay or something or something, uh, the, the planning report. So they everybody can uh, synchronize the information, how this thing is gonna work. Now, we spoke about the fact that the engineers here, they have to create the bill of material in this part. So uh, engineer design changes, the bill of material should be included there. So uh, the bill of material or BOM is contain uh, the complete product description such as uh, you know what it's made of what uh, what's this product made of what its component and all these things it also often called the product structure which is it just shows we will see how the, what we meant by the product structure or tree um, how many units is made of this how many units is made of this for doing the independent demand uh, there is we said there is dependent products so how many units is needed to put this all together and it's a module bills of material um, a, a, a buildable item that can be produced and stock and a, a super bill of material so it's right away the cost of producing the such could be a part of this uh, shows up. So the bill of material, let's say this part is the independent product that's ordered by the customer. Right away, what we're looking at, we uh, the engineers, are, they will divide this, they look at this and they say, okay, it's made of two parts of B1 and two parts of C, three parts of C1. Now, to produce the B2, uh, two parts of uh, B, uh, B level, then it's made of D1, one part D1 and E4. Now let's look at, let's say we wanna produce two units of A independent. So basically it's telling us that we need two Bs of unit Bs to be produced uh, and in the same time, this two Bs here, because it's two product, two multiply two becomes four B is needed. To produce the four Bs, we need, because one product, so one D, but because here to produce four Bs, uh, two Bs, it needs fours of them. So four multiplied by two, it becomes eight E and one D uh, to produce B2. On the other side, to produce this, uh, uh, the A, we said two units of B and three units of C. To build the three units, you need uh, two. So two multiply, uh, because we said we need two units of A, then so you need three multiplied by two becomes six. To produce six, uh, you need, so this is the numbers where it increases. But if we say we need one unit of A, to produce one unit of A, we need two Bs, and two B is made of one D and four E. And here, same time, we need C3, and C3 is made of two F, five G, and five. So all these are components of a final independent product that should be available in the warehouse and considering or should be available on time in warehouse in inventories. So to produce the, the, the second level and the second level will produce and showing the timing also within in it. Okay. Um, yeah, um, feel free the way you're gonna do your assignment. You can, you know, PDF, PowerPoint, um, uh, Word, I, I just uh, be creative of how you do the, your assignment. That shouldn't be any problem with me. Now, so this is the bill of material example. 
So the product A, the end item, you product A is consists of two, two units of B and three units of C. Now, three units of C is product, uh, product C itself consists each unit made of two units of F, two, five units of G and four units of H. So one product of C will need that much amount. And in the same time, the product B, each product of B needs of one product, one unit of D and four units of E. So imagine how complicated that can be uh, when it's, if you're not using an, an RP system. There's another way of looking at it. And it basically says, I want to produce a product A, which is made of product B and C. And product B made of one D and four units of E. And product C, which is eventually both together will produce A, is made of these two F, five units of G and four units of H. So this is the independent parts list. And here the single level, uh, it's, it's, it's a different way of looking at how you produce um, C from B to uh, C and B to A. And it, it shows you the breakdown of it. Now, there is two ways of looking at it. And this is according to the timing and how lower level. No need to pay because this is probably will confuse you a little bit. So it is all, it's all, it talks about the level of where uh, in the first example uh, on which level supposed to be produced. So higher level is, uh, is the final product, which is, and then comes in um, the lowest is the, the, the units that is made of, of it. And this is all help in how much it will be stocking in the inventories and when you're supposed to stock on the inventories. This is one of copies that if you go to a manufacturing, you will see the bill of materials, how it looks like. Uh, I mean, uh, the inventory status record, how it's looked like. As basically we saw it in a video also, it tells you about the part number, the description, the lead time is needed, the standard cost, the safety stock, how much amount. So it gives you uh, the first part. It talks about uh, the basic information describing the item itself and the information about um, whether it's available or not and the additional information that it's needed. Um, so I'm not, it, it, this is a summarize of whatever we were explaining. So I'm not gonna go over it. You can read it and it's just only summarize the thing. But here is how we gonna order the bill of materials. When can we order it and how we, how it's fit? Um, it's something that's called determination lot size. It can, uh, uh, in an MRP system is complicated. And it's, it's a difficult problem. So there is uh, something called a, a lot for lot. And it's basically, you can order the unit anytime. And it is, you don't, you, it, you don't need to say, if you need five, you can order five. You need six, you can order six. You need seven, you can order seven. That's a, diff, a lot for, for lot. And uh, sometimes, no, you cannot do that because there is a cost of ordering and it comes in a bulk. So you cannot order more, less than 12, for example. So that's, that's is called uh, the economic of order, the quantity. And uh, they are two different way of ordering. And economic order of the quantity, you have to order certain level versus uh, to, for two reasons. One is the supplier is telling you, I don't accept any order less, for example, than 100 units, or it tells you anytime you order, that's going to be a, a $1,000 um, order cost, shipping and handling. These two things, you take it into consideration to do the calculation of economic order of quantity. Um, 
a lot for a lot is, is, is a very easy, easier, a set of, uh, sets the plan order to exactly match the net requirement, how much you require to produce. I produce exactly what is needed each, each week within a non carry over into future periodic. So sometimes you don't, because this is like a just in time in a way, minimize the carrying costs and do not take uh, into consideration the cost capacity. Um, this is a best way. The second way is the economic uh, or EOQ. And uh, it's the best way uh, when I said, as I said, uh, when you do an order and uh, the order has two parts of it. First part, uh, as the supplier is telling you, you cannot order, for example, less than 100. And at the same time, it's telling you anytime you order, this is your price, and this is the amount for ordering, cost of ordering. So you look at these two. So you don't want to order a lot, and in the same time, uh, you don't want to order a little bit because sometimes the cost of ordering overpriced the order itself. As somebody who buys from Amazon, you buy one shirt and you probably $50 and uh, handling and shipping is another $50, $100. But when you go to a store, you find the shirt is for $80. So it's better you buy it from the shirt. But it's better you buy it if you buy two t-shirts from Amazon, because then um, it becomes what? Becomes two t-shirts, cost of $100, plus shipping and hundred, uh, handling is a $50. So 50 and 50 and plus 50 is 150. If you go to a store and buy two t-shirts and each one is a, a $80, both uh, two t-shirts becomes 160. So it's better that than you order from, for example, from Amazon. To explain this better, I like you to see this video and then we probably, done for uh, uh, today. Uh, so, um, and it's a nice video. I really like that video because it simplifies things very well. But um, just give me a second here. <clears throat> 